The iconic ghost town. A haunting reminder in the 21st century of that period in American history known as the Wild West. But what is a ghost town? Philip Varney is the greatest living authority on ghost towns. This definition is widely accepted. I say that a ghost town is a, a town that has two basic characteristics. One, its population is markedly lower than it was in its heyday. And secondly, that the reason for the existence of the town initially is no longer the reason why people are there. Kenneth Jessen is another expert on ghost towns. He sees that finding these relics of a bygone time should be on your must-do list. And I think the excitement is uh, getting there. The journey is often as exciting as the actual experience of walking around a place where people once lived and children once played and where there was commerce and sales and maybe even a few gunfights. But how did they come to be in the first place? As the United States population spread west from its original East Coast colonies to the Mississippi River, countless communities, towns, and cities sprang up. Some flourished. Others fell by the wayside and disappeared. last great westward push towards settling this vast country began after the American Civil War. It was a push into the Great Plains, into the rugged mountains of the west, and into the bleak landscapes of the desert southwest. It was the era of military forts to fend off Indian raids. of mining camps and towns where thousands hoped to strike it rich. Most of these places were short-lived. They experienced the boom and bust cycle of many mining towns and have been lost to the ravages of time. Others somehow hung on and survived as partial ghost towns. Towns where people still live, such as Silver Plume, Colorado. Towns that have become tourist attractions, including Virginia City, Montana, Bodie, California. And then there are ghost towns like Tombstone, Arizona. Towns where the past comes alive through reenactments. blacksmith shops to the fabled shootouts of the Wild West. Other old mining towns are flourishing today because of the introduction of gambling. Towns like Blackhawk and Cripple Creek, Colorado. And the infamous Deadwood, South Dakota, where legendary lawman Wild Bill Hickok met his fate. Real ghost towns and abandoned forts are those precious remains of the past that exist today only as shadows of former glories and wicked events. Events that linger at times like haunting ghosts. But why even care about these remnants of time gone by? Why do people go to ghost towns? I'm gonna to refer to a friend of mine, alas, who has died, Tony Hillerman, who wrote a preface for my, first, my second book, and in it he said this, to me, to many of my friends, to scores of thousands of Americans, these ghost towns offer a sort of touching place with the past. We stand in their dust and try to project our imagination backward into what they were long ago. Now and then, if the mood and the light and the weather 
are exactly right, we almost succeed. In this program, we'll look at the ghost towns of the desert southwest. The desert southwest is one of the most magical places on planet Earth. Stretching from Colorado to California, it is a nearly endless sea of low-lying mountain ranges and wide valleys. But mostly, it is desert. The Sonoran, known by its iconic saguaro cactus, and the Mojave with its stately Joshua trees. Filled with a haunting emptiness, the desert southwest spans a vast region of visual grandeur. A land in places rich in precious metals and filled with a never-ending wonderment. The desert southwest offers a special destination for ghost town lovers abandoned mining towns, historic gunfights. There are breathtaking thousand-year-old cities built into cliffs. It is home to the famous 20 Mule Team Borax Company, the West's most notorious territorial prison, Apache battle sites, magnet that drew America West, the discovery of gold at Sutter's Mill in California, and perhaps the best boom ghost town in the West, Ruby, Arizona. At first glance, the desert Southwest is one of the most inhospitable places on Earth. Desolate, harsh, Arid, this forbidding region seems hardly fit for human habitation. Indeed, NASA uses it to train astronauts for travel to Mars. But as early as 4,000 years ago, the first American Indians came here, part of the maize culture that would settle the region before the arrival of the first Europeans 3,500 years later. Nothing remains of these earliest farmers except their spectacular rock art. The sandstone cliffs of Sago Canyon have been used as an art gallery and a holy place for the native people of the area for over 4,000 years. Located in Utah, just a short drive off of I-70, it is a must stop. By far the most ancient art in the canyon is from the Barrier Canyon culture, a people only known by their advanced rock art paintings. Unlike the great rock art galleries of animal paintings in Europe, anthropomorphic images dominate the art of the Barrier Canyon culture. Both in size and number, the rock walls exhibit spirit figures, the citizen figures and the composite figures. It is hard not to recognize the resemblance to modern day alien images. On adjacent panels are petroglyphs from the Fremont culture and the contemporary Ute culture. South of Sago Canyon, Utah, are two easily accessible Fremont rock art sites. One is Newspaper Rock State Historic Monument. The other is just outside of Moab along the Colorado River on County Road 279. The Fremont culture thrived from about 600 AD to 1250 AD 
and was contemporary with the Anasazi culture of the Four Corners area. Here, nearly a thousand years ago, where the states of Colorado, Utah, New Mexico, and Arizona meet, the region's first magnificent ghost towns were built. In northeastern Arizona lies Canyon de Chez National Monument, part of the ancient home of the Anasazi. The monument, located entirely within the Navajo Indian Reservation, is actually a complex of canyons. Canyon de Chez, Canyon de Muerto, and Black Rock Canyon. Myth and religious scholar Joseph Campbell has called these canyons the most sacred place on earth. The name Anasazi was given by the Navajos to these earlier people. It means ancient enemy in Navajo. Is it perhaps that the Navajos believed malevolent ghosts of the Anasazi continued to haunt this land? About the time the first Roman Emperor Octavian Augustus was bringing a Pax Romana to the ancient Roman Empire, and Italy's own ghost town of Pompeii was being destroyed by the eruption of Mount Vesuvius, the first Anasazi started settling in Canyon de Chez. It is one of the longest continuously inhabited places in North America. Historically, the first Anasazi relics in Canyon de Chez date from about 90 AD. However, they did not arrive in significant numbers until 200 years later, and thereafter made the canyon their home until they disappeared from the pages of history around 1275 AD. The Anasazi farmed the canyon, growing beans, maize, and squash, raising cotton, domesticating turkeys and dogs while hunting wild game throughout the area. Around 700 AD, the Anasazi built immense cliff dwellings on the south-facing canyon walls. These stone and mortar structures provided year-round lodging. They were shaded in the summer by the overhanging ledge and warmed in the winter by southern exposures. cliffs may also have provided protection. Today, these remarkably preserved ghost towns, such as First Ruin and White House, can be viewed from overlooks along a network of roads winding through the monument. To get close to these ancient ghost towns, you'll have to hire a Navajo guide, a guide who will steep you in the haunting lore of the area and reveal the meaning of the land to them. When you're down there, it's like the canyon is, is still alive. You can feel the, all that energy in, inside of you. And it's basically different from the water streaks, like the black lines you can see. Mm -hmm. and that's, what, that's what attracts most of the people is the, the desert varnish. Yeah. While the Navajo occupied northern Arizona, the famous Apache ruled the south. The Apache moved into their southern Arizona homelands prior to the arrival of the first Europeans in the 16th century. Part of a very large subarctic group generally referred to as Athabascan-speaking Indians, sometime after 1000 AD, a nomadic group identified as the Southern Athabascans migrated south into present-day West Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. These prehistoric Apache roamed over a large region, never settling down like their northern neighbors, preferring the lifestyle of hunter-gatherers. For hundreds of years, the Apache defeated all interlopers into their territory. The Spanish, the Mexicans, the Navajo. That all changed after Arizona became part of the United States following the Mexican-American War in 1848. From that point on, Americans began trickling into the state, a trickle that became a surge 
and inevitably led to a 25-year guerrilla war between the U.S. military and the Apache. A war whose ghosts hover over the 1.5-mile trek to Arizona's Fort Bowie. It is a slow climb into history. A climb through the dry Sonoran Desert. Approximately halfway up, you come upon the ruins of one of the 240 stations spaced along the 2,800-mile-long Butterfield Overland Mail Route from St. Louis to San Francisco. Beginning in 1858, it carried mail and passengers flawlessly for over three years. In fact, the Apache leader Cochise and his people supplied wood to the station workers. Standing at the ruins, one can follow the old stage route a short distance east to the place where everything changed. To the place where the Apache Wars began in 1861 in what has been referred to as the Bascom Affair. It involved Cochise, perhaps the best known chief of all the American Indian Wars. Never photographed, he had been an advocate of peace until he and his villagers were wrongly accused of kidnapping children and cattle from John Ward's ranch. In late October of 1860, Coyotero Apaches raided John Ward's ranch, which was located on the very southern border of Arizona, across from Old Mexico. They stole his livestock, and they stole his 12-year-old stepson, who, was, uh, who became later known as Mickey Free. Uh, the Indians that were blamed, uh, although they may have been Coyoteros, the uh, Chiricahuas were blamed under Cochise. John Ward went to Fort Buchanan nearby and asked for help to get his livestock back and his stepson. Um, leaving Fort Buchanan was Lieutenant George Bascom with a number of 7th Infantry men. Thinking that Cochise had taken the stock and the boy, he marched east to the Chiricahua Mountains where Cochise was known to, to be staying. Uh, he arranged a meeting with Cochise, and Cochise agreed to, uh, to meet with him. Bascom moved into Siphon Canyon and set his tents up, which was just a little bit east of Apache Pass. Cochise came in with his family, not expecting anything to happen. Uh, he went into the tent and met with Bascom. Bascom confronted him and said, where's the livestock? Where's the, where's the boy of John Ward that you stole? Well, Cochise didn't know anything about it. Uh, he didn't do it, but he said that if you give me about 10 days, I can probably find the boy for you. Bascom uh, said that, well, that would be fine, but he was going to hold his family hostage in the meantime. Well, that didn't go over well with Cochise at all. He pulled out a knife, slid open the tent that he was in, ran out the backside and up the hill amidst a, a barrage of firing from the soldiers. Uh, the, uh, the affair uh, was known later as either the cut the tent affair or the Bascom Affair, and uh, it became a, a, a point in, uh, in our history of uh, the, where we can consider probably that the Apache Wars really began from that point on. Cochise then took his own hostage, James F. Wallace, a station attendant of the Butterfield Stagecoach Line. Over the next two weeks, the Bascom Affair escalated rapidly. The Apache raided ranches and mail coaches. Bascom took more hostages. When the lieutenant refused to release Cochise's relatives, the Apache leader killed Wallace and mutilated his body so badly he could only be identified through the fillings in his teeth. On February 19th, Bascom retaliated by hanging three of Cochise's relatives. Thus began a bloody guerrilla war that lasted for 25 years. Cochise and his father-in-law, Mangus Coloradus, vowed to drive the whites from Arizona. A short distance up the trail, you can experience the reality of that vow at the Fort Bowie Post Cemetery. Here, the graves speak of the terrible death and war between the Americans and the Apaches. Of the most famous soldiers buried here is Medal of Honor recipient O.O. Spence. In addition to the soldiers buried nearby, there are the graves of civilian employees, Native Americans, 
immigrants, mail carriers, and three Apache children, one of which was Geronimo's two-year-old son. Legends state that ghost lights are often seen in the fall and early winter, whirling about the cemetery. These ghost lights are said to be the spirits of the people who died at or near the fort. The balls of light are usually blue or white in color. On quiet days, park rangers have heard the sound of horses riding by the peaceful cemetery. A short distance up the trail stands another group of ruins. The ruins of the Chiricahua Apache Indian Agency. Originally built in 1869, here the esteemed U.S. Indian agent, Thomas Jeffords, governed around 900 Chiricahua Apaches from 1875 to 1876. Off in the distance appears our first look at the ruins of Fort Bowie. Further up the trail, we encounter what made this historic piece of land so precious, Apache Spring. Apache Spring has a long history of use. Pottery fragments found nearby suggest prehistoric Mogollon Indians used the spring before the arrival of the Apache. The Butterfield Overland Trail was constructed through Apache Pass simply to take advantage of the prized spring water. Because the spring was the lifeblood of the Apache, the conflict between Cochise and the California militia was mainly a dispute over the spring water. Ironically, Fort Bowie may never have been built here except for the water. At last, the first of the fort ruins are nearby. Here the trail splits and one can move forward to the main set of Fort Bowie ruins or walk through the site where the first Fort Bowie was built and get a look at the infamous Apache Pass. The place where the most famous Apache battle in the desert southwest took place. The Battle of Apache Pass. In 1862, Mangus and Cochise learned that Union General James H. Carleton was marching 1,800 men east from California to New Mexico. They gathered together the largest single force of Apache ever assembled, over 700 warriors. At Apache Pass, they laid a trap. Apache Pass in southeastern Arizona was a strategic point. It was located between the Dos Cabezos Mountains and the Chiricahua Mountains on the north and south, and between the Chihuahuan Desert and the Sonoran Desert on the east and west. And in between, right in the middle of the pass, was a little spring of fresh water. That was very important to any travelers who were coming through the area. They almost always had to go through Apache Pass. The, uh, that this time, there was a column of California troops under uh, James Carleton going to, marching to New Mexico to fight the rebels, and the Indians knew it. Uh, Cochise, Mangus Coloradus, assembled a great force of Apache warriors in the pass, waiting for the troops to arrive. Uh, the first advance guard of, uh, of about 120 or so men of the California Infantry under Lieutenant Thomas Roberts approached the pass uh, without, uh, without warning. Suddenly shots were fired from, the, from, the, from near the spring and from the mountainsides on both sides of the pass. Uh, Roberts couldn't, couldn't uh, dislodge the Indians. They were firing from all around him. He backed off into the valley a bit opened up with his two mountain howitzers and started blasting shells into the rocks. The exploding shells and the uh, jagged pieces of flying rock finally drove the Indians away, drove them back out uh, a distance away where Roberts could move up into the pass and take the water hole. Uh, the next day, uh, Carlton came up with the main force and had to fight his way in again, uh, but they eventually secured the pass. After this fight, the Apache never again fought a mass action. Preferring to attack small groups of miners, undefended ranches, and unwary travelers, 
often killing and in the tradition of the Plains Indians, mutilating their victims. A year later, Mangus Coloradus was killed. Cochise continued to fight on until 1874, when he suddenly fell ill and died somewhere near here. His grave is yet to be discovered. In 1876, the second Fort Bowie was built at the beginning of what is now called Geronimo's War. During the war, Fort Bowie was a combat hub for military operations against the Chiricahua Apache. The post even reached a population of 304 men during this time, when the usual strength of the post was about 150 men. It wasn't until the Chiricahua surrendered in September 1886 that Fort Bowie settled down to enjoy some of the amenities of life. The fort boasted corrals and stables, a quartermaster storehouse, a post trader, a school, an adjutant's office, infantry barracks, officer's row, a commanding officer's quarters, a new hospital and steward's quarters, tailor shop, cavalry barracks, and mess halls and kitchens. Fort Bowie closed October 17, 1894. What sparked all this travel through Arizona's Apache territory was an event that occurred in 1848. The discovery of gold in California at Sutter's Mill, and what has become the oldest and first boom town of the American West. In the desert Southwest, boom towns were always about precious metals. The discovery of silver, but most importantly gold, that triggered a gold rush and consequently the building of a boom town. In 1848, rancher John Sutter needing timber for his utopian town near present-day Sacramento, commissioned itinerant carpenter James Marshall to build a sawmill along the banks of the American River in the Western Sierras, right here at what is now called the Marshall Gold Discovery State Historic Park. James Marshall built, uh, began building the sawmill, and it was just about the time it was complete, in 1848, he was checking the water that was running through the trace that operated the sawmill when he found a little pea-sized, glittering piece of rock. And the gold rush was on. Ironically, neither John Sutter nor James Marshall would ever make a dime for the gold that Marshall found on Sutter's property. Within just months, those hills were filled with 80,000 prospectors climbing all over Sutter's land, stealing his livestock, living off his crops. And who abandoned him? Everybody. There's a lot more money to be made in finding gold than there is in building an agricultural utopia. What sprang up around the discovery site was the town of Coloma. Coloma's a boom town. Before long, it had 300 buildings in it, thousands of people, with all of the trappings of the typical type of ghost town that would set the standard across the nation with the gambling houses and the saloons and the painted ladies and the wild miners and all of it. Even though it was a rich gold find, it spread quickly. And once you find gold in one place, maybe there's gold in more. And all of those hundreds of thousands of men began to spread out throughout Northern California and mining camp after mining camp after mining camp sprang up. And Coloma, Coloma didn't last long. Before long, the new hub was Placerville. And so all of the money and all of the businessmen and all of the body houses and the painted ladies and everybody moved away, leaving about 200 people. The boom and bust pattern of mining towns that would eventually become ghost towns was now in place. 
Park historian Ed Allen explains the ABCs of gold on which the boom-bust cycle operated. So the first type, type of gold that James Marshall found here was called placer gold. Placer is an ancient Spanish term that means sand bank. We find gold like this in the sand banks along the creeks and rivers. Now this piece here that I'm pointing to, that's a nugget. And a nugget means all gold. But in a sense, I just lied to you because gold is never found in a pure form. It's always an alloy. This piece here we believe to be about 94% gold and about 6% silver. Now this piece here is from the Yuba River and it still has a small piece of quartz down inside of it, right down in there. It's about 85% gold, the rest being copper and uh, silver. So ver it varies considerably through the mother load. And some of the things that, uh, that alloy with gold are even more expensive than gold, like platinum, osmium. Um, so your gold can actually be worth more than the gold value. So this was a consideration in the old days when you sold your gold to a merchant. Generally, you got about $16 an ounce for your gold, but the government, the government paid $20.67 an ounce for pure gold delivered to the mint. So this is the kind of gold you get in the river, and this is the kind of gold that you get from a hard rock gold mine. And here, in this piece of quartz, you can actually see the vein of gold running through it. So this is gonna be crushed generally in a stamp mill, and mercury is going to be used to extract the gold. Also, later on, cyanide was used. 30 years later, another town sprang up on the eastern side of the Sierras. It was Bodie, California, and in 1880, it was the second largest city in California. Now, it is a ghost town. Bodie is the king of the ghost towns in the western United States. Nothing rivals it, as far as I'm concerned. It has dozens of buildings. It had hundreds of buildings, but it has dozens of buildings in an absolutely gorgeous setting. It's at over 8,000 feet elevation, which means that it is, has limited accessibility, but it also means that it is up in some starkly beautiful country. As mining played out on the western side of the Sierra Nevada mountains, uh, miners started coming over. At first, some ore was discovered by William Bodie in what is now known as Bodie Bluff around 1859. Uh, he died pretty, pretty quick, within the first year. However, his discovery was known, so many of the miners started moving across the mountain range of the Sierra Nevada to come into Bodie afterwards. Bodie grew slowly at first. In fact, it was pretty insignificant for about 17 years until a large, rich vein of gold was discovered in about 1877. By the end of 1879, there were over 10,000 residents in Bodie, California. Um, 2,000 buildings and numerous saloons, opium dens, um, brothels, pretty much a, a lawless type town. Uh, in fact, so many saloons, they had 65 saloons, so many that saloons were every other building along their mile-long Main Street. Waterman Bodie is 1859, but it's not until the 1880s and 1890s when the true prospects of this place were revealed. And the place exploded. It became a town of, I think it's like 10, 12,000, something like that. It's not a small town at all but it's virtually entirely made out of wood. There are a couple of exceptions, but it's virtually entirely made out of wood, which can spell, of course, disaster. There was a fire in 1892 that burned a lot of it, and after the days, great days of Bodie were over, there was a second fire in 1932 that just decimated what would have been a pricelessly historic ghost town, but it's still awfully darn good. Legend has it that Bodie today is highly haunted. A few of the residents of Bodie remained until after World War II, when the final mine shut down and most of the population left. Uh, about six residents remained, though, and all, about five of them would meet some untimely deaths. A man killed his wife, and then three other residents killed the man for murdering his wife. And it's said that, legend has it anyway, that the 
ghost of the murdered man wound up haunting the three other that killed him and they would die soon after of unnatural disease. We did pay attention to the Bodhi curse, which states that if you take even one item from the ghost town of Bodhi, bad luck is coming your way. Now, a lot of people say that the Bodhi curse was created by the park rangers to make sure that nothing left the park, but I can tell you that they believe in it. The park rangers actually keep a log book of the people who have returned items and there's several letters that the museum holds to this day from people who have written about their experience of taking an item and then having to bring it back. So the Bodhi, Bodhi curse, we believed in it, made sure that we didn't get struck by it. Today, Bodhi is in a state of arrested decay. It is a must-see and experience for all ghost hunters and ghost town connoisseurs. And so is Rhyolite, just across the California border into Nevada. Rhyolite is a perfect example of a classic, colossal boom and bust. It was founded and basically is after the turn of the century, about 1908. And the prospects were so incredible for gold that Rhyolite was going to be the new Denver or something like that. And so remarkable buildings were constructed. Three railroads built branch lines to it. There, was a, there, were, there were brick buildings and stone buildings everywhere. It lasted until 1916, eight years. Pretty soon, by 1920, nobody lived there. And it's a fascinating ghost town these days. The depot and a lot of the old downtown structures are still intact, although very little of the uh, homes where people lived are still there. But there's also this incredible public art museum called the Goldwell Open Air Museum that for fans of unique and quirky and avant-garde public art, it's a must stop. Uh, there's a uh, interpretation of the Last Supper made with these ghostly frozen fabrics uh, so that uh, somebody had probably climbed into them and sculpted them and so it looks like this invisible humans in them uh, in each of them and then there's a whole last supper of them alongside each other there's also a, you know a couple other quirky pieces there and it's really a it was one of my favorite memories is stopping a rhyolite with my father a few years ago a few of the other pieces in the open air art museum are Sit here, Ghost Rider, and Lady Desert, the Venus of Nevada. All that survives today of this once bustling boom town are the Cook Bank building, the Rhyolite Mercantile General Store, and the once glorious train station. Sandwiched between Bodie and Rhyolite is Death Valley. Although many searched this harsh environment for the mother load, no gold of significance was ever found. Instead, what was found was called white gold, borax. The 20-mule team rigs that moved ore from the mines to the rail junction has become an iconic image of the Old West. The discovery of borax, north of the mouth of Furnace Creek, was made in 1881. A year later, the Harmony Borax Works began mining operations, and a small settlement of adobe and stone buildings, plus a refinery, sprang up along the spring. This remarkable oasis, created by the abundant water supply of the Travertine Springs, became a haven for miners. Alfalfa fields that supported the mules and horses. And a date ranch. By the end of the 1920s, mining operations in Death Valley were abandoned. 
and the Borax Company decided to install tourist housing at the old ranch. Today, in addition to being the hub of social activities in the park, Furnace Creek Ranch contains a remarkable open-air museum commemorating the mining history of the area. Open to the public in 1954, its highlights include a 20-mule team borax cart pulled by mules, as well as their eventual replacement, a steam-powered locomotive. Other attractions include the oldest structure in Death Valley, built around 1883. An old stagecoach, and many remnants of both the mining and milling operations that once dominated the landscape in Death Valley. Since 1860, Arizona has produced a total of about 13,321,000 ounces of gold, over $18 billion in today's market, and ranks eighth among the gold-producing states. As happened everywhere in the West, Arizona's mountains held the first discoveries of gold in what are called placer deposits along stream beds. Shortly afterward, the source of the easily retrieved placer gold, the mother loads, were identified. In most of Arizona's mining districts, Highly industrialized milling produced the bulk of the gold output. Such was the case with one of the oldest gold mining operations in the state. North of Phoenix is a prized mining ghost town, home of the celebrated Vulture Mine, a mine founded in 1863 by Henry Wickenburg. It was called the Vulture, supposedly, because Henry Wickenburg shot a vulture while it went near the, near the site and named it after that. I think that the, the vulture peak predates the vulture mine and was already vulture peak, and so he just took the name of the mine. For one thing, why would anybody waste ammunition on a vulture? There's no sense to that at all. But he found a considerable amount of ore, and vulture today still has lots of excellent buildings. There are, uh, there's a, a mill, a stamp mill, a assay office that if you believe the hype, that was built from, that was constructed from rocks from the early diggings and that there's more gold in the building than the building is worth. Vulture is much more complete than most ghost towns. There is, uh, the open is now open to the air, the roof is gone, but there's the old jail and next to the jail is the only tree in the entire area of any size that is reputed to be the hanging tree. There are also lots of other buildings there, including dormitory. Uh, there was a uh, dining hall that, as far as I know, the roof fell in, and as far as I know, it has not been put back up. But still, uh, Vulture is a real, real treasure. Vulture is available for touring only on select days for a small admission fee. So make sure you plan well in advance if you want to experience this wonderful ghost town. However, nearby the town cemetery is free, historic and highly photogenic, and well worth a visit. Far to the southeast is Arizona's most historic mining district. Not because of the gold and silver it produced, but because the Wild West's most famous event happened here. One of my very favorite places I've ever been is Tombstone. Even though it's commercial, even though a lot of it is recreated, there's so much history there. And I like the places that have lots and lots of history, that have lots of interesting characters. Even if they weren't necessarily good characters, it still 
you have the history of the characters and you have the history of the town itself. So you've got the gold mining, you've got the old buildings, you've got Doc Holliday, which I'm enamored with, not so much Wyatt Earp, but Doc Holliday. Um, you know, the Cowboys, the Clanton gang, you know, all of that. Um, you got the Painted Ladies, you got the Birdcage Theater, you know, which is very allegedly haunted. Originally established in 1881 and operated as the place in Tombstone where booze-soaked dramas played themselves out nightly until the silver crash in 1889. It was described in the New York Times as the wickedest night spot between New Orleans' rough and tumble Basin Street and San Francisco's infamous Barbary Coast. It was the site of countless deaths by gunfire. Since its reopening as a museum, visitors have heard women faintly singing, children crying from their cribs, phantoms working their way across rooms, and countless other unexplained phenomena. But what Tombstone is really known for is the only documented Wild West shootout. John Rose is an expert on the shootout at the OK Corral. The shootout started with the activities of those cowboy gangs, which included Curly Bill and Ringo, who were rustling cattle along the Arizona-Mexico border. You have this cowboy element, uh, and there's, there's these honest ranchmen, and then there's this local pejorative, this term cowboy curse, cowboy gang, and these fellows are an interesting entrepreneurial bunch. They, um, they raid up in here. So they'll raid in Arizona, for example. They'll steal horses and cattle up here, and then they'll take them down to Mexico. Then in one part of Mexico, they'll sell those horses and cattle, and then they'll go to another part of Mexico, steal their horses and cattle, and then run them back up here and sell them up here. Kind of like Walmart, never an empty truck. The most infamous members of this loose confederation of cattle rustlers were the clanton McClory faction. Brothers Frank and Tom McClory made up one half, and brothers Ike and Billy Clanton made up the other half. Both operated from their own family ranches near Tombstone, Arizona. This isn't your Rex Allen, Hopalong Cassidy, good guy cowboy, that, that venerated figure from the American West. When we talk about the cowboy gang here, we talk about a loose confederation of outlaws that are under kind of an umbrella, and they operate in and out of southern Arizona and eastern New Mexico, western New Mexico, northern Mexico, and they're involved in these activities between stagecoach robbing, between cattle rustling, there's honest ranchmen, and they're separate. You know, we're not saying that those guys are criminals. In fact, the honest ranchmen in the area didn't care for the cowboy gang because they were preyed upon. It's interesting because when the, uh, when the Earps collided with some of these people, there were some ironies. Not, not rules across the board, but a lot of these cowboys were Democrats, and a lot of them were Southern sympathizers. Uh, the Earps, despite their father's Confederate sympathies, the Earps were all uh, pro-Union during the Civil War. Virgil Earp was in the Civil War on the Union side. James Earp was wounded on behalf of the Union on, the, on that side. Um, and many of the Cowboys were uh, sympathetic to the Confederacy as well as uh, being Democrats. The Earps were staunch Republicans. The Earp Law Gang was led by Wyatt, perhaps the most controversial figure in the Old West. Was he a good guy or a bad guy? Or was he both? Born in 1848 in Monmouth, Illinois, in his early 20s, he drifted around the West, hunting buffalo and engaging in a variety of illicit actions and operations. Until at the age of 28, he became a deputy sheriff in Dodge City, Kansas, a member of the formidable Masterson Law Gang. This was a, a gang of people, you know? It wasn't just a guy, it was four or five brothers, friends, they all had guns, they all had badges. And, and we, I've got a contemporary diary that calls them the Earp Gang. So I think that suggests why their reputation grew. Um, they had a reputation for violence that was, it wasn't actual in fact. But they would not stand down. Bat Masterson writes later that Wyatt Earp, judged by true courage, 
said he was the bravest man he'd met in his life. He had no physical fear at all. By 1881, the full cast of characters for the gunfight at the OK Corral, the Earp Law Gang and the Cowboy Gang, was assembled in Arizona's newest mining boomtown, Tombstone. On October 25th of that year, around noon, rumors that the Cowboys are planning to ambush and kill the Earps reached Wyatt and his brothers. But since the Cowboys are not carrying guns, there's nothing to be done. Then, as the rumors persist, Doc Holliday leaves his boarding house and joins the Earps in town. Now you have everyone in place. You have Doc Holliday, Morgan Earp is there, Wyatt Earp is there, Virgil Earp is there. So that's going to be the Earp party. And the Cowboys are on the ground too. Frank McClary, Tom McClary, Ike and Billy Clanton. So you have all these people mixed together. The Earps, by about 3 o'clock, decide to go confront the Cowboys. Virgil decides that he doesn't want to look too provocative with the shotgun he's just borrowed from the Wells Fargo office. So he trades Doc Holliday as Kane. He figures that the town marshal doesn't have the deadliest weapon that'll look better to the Cowboys when he goes down to disarm him. He makes the mistake of handing the shotgun to Doc Holliday of all people, the one that the Cowboys probably truly fear the most and dislike the most. The deadliest weapon is now in the deadliest hands is how the Cowboys are likely going to see this. The Earps travel north on 4th Street. They head down uh, Fremont Street Sheriff Behan sees them. He's been down talking to the Cowboys. Ironically, he's just convinced Frank McClowry, who refused to give up his guns earlier, to go to his office with him and give up his guns there. Had Frank McClowry agreed and just handed the gun to Behan right then, he could not have been shot. Why? Because you don't shoot an unarmed man in the West. You just don't. Even Doc Holliday, the night before, as angry as he was and wanting to kill Ike Clanton so badly, did not dare fire at him because he didn't have a gun. The best defense in the Old West, if someone wants to shoot you, is to not have a gun. Frank McClary refused to give up his gun. Billy Clanton should have given up his gun. They don't. Now the Earps are going down. Behan runs towards them. He's trying to get the Cowboys to his office, but it's too late. The Earps are now in motion. He runs towards them. Don't go down there. I've been down there to disarm them. Virgil says, we'll disarm them, Johnny, brushes him aside and continues on down. Now the Earps will say in trial, and I think they're lying about this, Behan will now say, don't go down there, you'll all be killed. Doesn't make any sense. Because the Earps claim that they relaxed their positions of their arms because Johnny had claimed that they had been disarmed. These are smart frontiersmen. They're not going to let their, their guard down for anybody. They're too smart for that. They travel down Fremont Street and they swing around the corner of Fly's boarding house and there they are. The two Clantons and the two McClowries. Billy the Kid Claiborne, another cowboy friend is there. Wesley Fuller is in the area. They quickly decide this fight is not for them, they leave. Virgil yells, throw up your hands, we're here for your guns. And the critical moment occurs. For a nanosecond, there's this dead silence, no one moves. And then all of a sudden, Frank McClowry starts to motion toward his gun. Now, if you're a big fan of the Cowboys, you'll say, well, maybe he was wanting to give it up. Wrong time to give up your gun, don't you think? When the police are saying, we're here for your gun, you don't reach for it. He starts to reach for his gun, but he hesitates. Frank McClary may have discovered that he really didn't want to kill. That's a good thing. It's a bad thing to learn about yourself when you're in the middle of a gunfight. And he is, and he doesn't realize it. He started to reach for his gun. That put Wyatt Earp in motion. Wyatt Earp had a philosophy about gunfighting. Fast is fine, but accuracy is final. He also said it was about playing the odds. He starts to reach. Now he sees that Frank McClary is starting to draw again. Now what happens is Billy Clanton is drawing as well. Wyatt Earp, in a nanosecond, sees two men drawing on him at once. What's he going to do? He only gets one shot. He knows that Billy Clanton is just a teenager, dragged into this by the loud mouth of his older brother, but Frank McClary has the reputation of being a real gunman on this side. He's gonna give Billy Clanton a free shot. He's gonna draw slowly and deliberately, very smoothly, at Frank McClary, shoot him. He fires, he hits him in the stomach. Frank McClary doubles over. That doesn't mean he won't do a lot more damage in the fight, but now the most lethal gunman on the cowboy side is mortally wounded, the advantage immediately flips in favor of the Earps. Billy Clanton fires, the bullet flies right past Wyatt, and he's unwounded. Now what happens is Ike Clanton, the very guy who picked the fight more than anyone else, still doesn't have a gun. And he runs right across the field. I'm not healed, I'm not healed. He grabs Wyatt Earp, I'm not healed. What is he doing for Wyatt Earp? He's saving his life. He's blocking him. Cowboys can't shoot at Wyatt Earp because he's got Clanton right there. 
it's perfect for him. It is said that 30 bullets were fired in 30 seconds. In the end, the McClory brothers and young Billy Clanton are dead. Doc Holliday, Virgil and Morgan Earp are wounded. Wyatt and Ike, the two responsible for the fight, are unscathed. This half minute long gunfight is the biggest and perhaps the only straight up gunfight between two warring factions in the Old West. However, the war was not over. On December 28, 1881, Virgil Earp is nearly killed by a shotgun blast. Three months later, Morgan is just as unlucky. He's felled by a single bullet, shot in the back. The Cowboys get their revenge. However, Wyatt now goes on his own ride of revenge, the infamous Vendetta. In the next year, Wyatt kills two of the Cowboy gang members. Forced to leave Arizona to avoid being arrested, Wyatt wandered throughout what remains of the Old West and Alaska, finally settling in Los Angeles, where he died in 1929 at the age of 81 from natural causes. Doc Holliday died in Glenwood Springs, Colorado from tuberculosis in 1887. Today, the reenactment of the classic Western gunfight has become the staple of many tourist-oriented Western ghost towns. None does it better than the annual gathering of the gunfighters competition in the historic and haunted Yuma, Arizona Territorial Prison. Throughout a weekend, usually in January or February, the old prison rings out with gunshots as gunfighter groups play out the Old West's most celebrated gunfights. Built near the historic Yuma Crossing, the prison received its first inmates in 1876. The story of the Yuma Crossing began at the formation of two massive granite outcroppings on the Colorado River. As a result, the narrowing of the river created an easy crossing first for Native Americans and later the Spanish. With the advent of the California Gold Rush in 1849, prospectors had a southern route to the gold fields, one less harrowing than crossing the Sierra Nevadas. Indeed, Yuma Crossing was what made the Butterfield Overland stage route possible. In order to protect and manage this vital resource, the U.S. government built Fort Yuma. During the Civil War, the post was critical in keeping the desert southwest in Union hands. Today, the fort's site is the home of the St. Thomas Indian Mission, towering over the area. At the Civil War's end, the Yuma Quartermaster Depot was built as a critical supply hub for the forts, including Fort Bowie, engaged in the Indian Wars to the east. Today, the Yuma Crossing National Heritage Area encompasses all the sites, including the Yuma Territorial Prison. The Rock and Adobe Prison was actually built by seven unfortunate convicts who eventually occupied its first cells. Every kind of criminal from killers to robbers to swindlers to perverts to gamblers to Mormon polygamists and even some innocents were crammed into these tiny cells. Over 3,000 men and women served time here, many dying in the cramped quarters. It's still a very historic place. It's a wonderful place to visit. There is a, there is a prison graveyard. There is the uh, overlook, the, uh, the basic uh, uh, quarters for the guards to, to watch over the watchtower, I guess is the word I'm looking for. And you can tour the prison extensively. It's uh, absolutely wonderful. It also is a, is a place of lots of good stories. There's one, for example, of a guy who was a Mexican national and he bragged 
to a guard and, and, and a fellow inmates that he had killed many people in Mexico. And so the warden let Mexico know. And they came and got him, took him across the border, and murdered him. Probably the most famous prisoner at the Yuma prison was Pearl Hart, who was a notorious bank robber, and she served time there. And you can see lots of memorabilia of pearls in the cases. The, the museum, of course, is what is now the most important part in terms of the history. Uh, shows us that uh, lots of memorabilia, locks, uh, weapons that were confiscated and so forth. Yuma was, the, the territorial prison was well placed because escape really wasn't all that likely because of the absolutely difficult conditions around it. The Colorado River at that time had a lot of swamp land in it. Mexico was on the other side, but Mexico was not exactly a, a, a happy place to be if you were an, ex, if you're an escaping convict. And, of course, just the heat would be amazingly difficult. I'm not saying people did escape, but there were also people whose bones were never found. Many of the paranormal sensitive have immediate feelings of dread when they enter the prison. It is said what they're feeling is the ghost of John Ryan. John Ryan was a family man who fell into debauchery with the birth of his third child, and by 1899, he was said to be possessed. In that year, he was committed to the prison for the ambiguous charges of crimes against nature. Ranting the whole time in prison, he was often banished to the solitary dark cell. On March 31st, 1903, Ryan was found dead. He had hung himself in the now infamous Cell 14. The prison closed six years later in 1909. Competing in the shootout is a team from Pioneer Living History Village, located 30 miles north of Phoenix. Here, in relative comfort and ease, you can step back in time and experience territorial Arizona. The village, created to capture Arizona's history, primarily between the years 1870 to 1890, houses 30 historic buildings moved here from other locations, as well as other buildings which are accurate reproductions. There is a blacksmith shop, sheriff's office and jail, and a complete ranch complex. Costumed interpreters, including cowboys, outlaws, and lawmen, reenact gunfights. At the other end of the ghost town's spectrum is Ruby, Arizona, located in Santa Cruz County in South Central Arizona, along the Mexican border. All of its buildings are original. It has a long history of silver and gold strikes. And its record of brutal murders is legendary. Off the beaten path, it is hard to get to and dangerous. Illegal immigrants and drug smuggling are rampant. Even its name is interesting. The owner of the mercantile was given permission by the U.S. Postal Service to name the town after his wife, Lily B. Ruby. By 1946, it was a true ghost town with zero population. Although today there is one caretaker. Ruby is a, a really interesting ghost town and for years and years and years to people like me in the 1970s and 1980s, it was the elusive ghost town. The thing you could come up to the, to the gate and see 
some of, but you knew there was much more inside. It used to have a sign in front of it that said, no trespassing, survivors will be prosecuted. I was fortunate in that I got to know the caretaker and he would let me in when people, other people weren't getting in, so I took groups into Ruby. Now the word is much better. You can, there are, there's a telephone number, you can find about it, out it, about it on the web, and you can visit Ruby for a fee. It has a fine schoolhouse. It has two crumbling teacheridges. I think people forget that if you've got a school, you've got to have a teacher. And if you're in a mining community, the teachers need accommodations. And so there would often be a building that was on a residence right next door to the school, maybe two residences in the case of Ruby, in which the teachers could be housed. It also has an assay office and a mine office, uh, lots of uh, hospital, doctor's quarters, it has many, many buildings. Now, they are in severe decay. Ruby, in the best of all worlds, would be owned by the state of Arizona and protected. The buildings are not really being preserved or restored or even maintained. They're left to die away uh, their ghost town death. Many of them falling down, uh, an old school that had many of the furniture, uh, desks, the chalkboards, still with writing on them, uh, just like the classroom had up and walked away. One of the delights of Ruby is that we are able to freely walk through a number of its old buildings. The school, of course. Teachers' houses. And in a narrow hallway, a piano is still playable. even a creepy sighting of a ghostly figure. Indeed, ghost hunters have flocked to Ruby as well. Caretaker Michael Thesai told us why. Uh, a little room there in the hills, the old mercantile, that was a store. Uh, twice, Mexican bandits came up. They uh, murdered several people each time. Uh, both uh, owners, wives, uh, relatives that were visiting. Uh, they actually pulled the teeth out of uh, the women's mouth, gold teeth, and uh, that was how they got caught once. They were in a bar trying to sell these gold teeth, and the sheriff happened to be sitting in the corner having a brew, and uh, saw him selling, trying to sell the teeth, and that's how they got caught. Sometimes uh, parapsychologists will come out and they'll set up uh, scientific equi equipment, high gain microphones, electric magnetic sensors, uh, to see if they can find some uh, uh, evidence of the tragedies that happened at the building. And uh, they've said they've got some uh, very unusual no anomalous results. The other place of paranormal activity is in the ruins of the mining office complex. a complex that contained the remains of the assayer's office. The other place that we've had, uh, that there was a tragedy here at uh, Ruby, uh, was uh, up on the hill in the assay office. Uh, the assay office is where they would analyze the core samples to determine where the highest concentration of ore was. And uh, there's a lot of chemicals to do that testing. And the chemist, his wife had an affair and he found out about it. So he went up to this, the office and mixed himself a little cocktail and chugged it on down and killed himself. Ruby is just one of the ghosts of the desert southwest that is slipping away into oblivion. If you want to walk through a place of a time long gone, feel the spirits of people long gone, hurry.